Welcome to Just Energy Radio with your host, naturopath and medical intuitive, Dr. Reed Louise. We have learned from Einstein's theory that matter and energy are one. Physicists believe that all systems in nature have their own particular way of vibrating, from the swinging of a pendulum to the waves of the ocean to the light that brightens the sky each day. Each of these oscillates at its own unique rate. The same holds true for every thought, feeling, event, or word we speak. Each has its own frequency or rate of vibration. What many of us don't realize is when we take everything in our universe down to its simplest form, it is all just energy. Join Dr. Rita Louise on a journey through time and space where past, present, and future collide. Today, what you believe may be called into question. What we want to know is... Who made up the rules? Be brave and step outside the box. We are about to turn our world upside down and venture into the unknown. Hold on. We are departing our own beliefs and entering alternative realms. Enjoy the possibilities. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Louise, and thank you all for tuning into the show today. We are going to have a wonderful two hours. We're going to have a good friend of the show, Frank Joseph, coming on and talking about lost civilizations, where we're going to be focusing on Atlantis and Lemuria. And Frank's just a great researcher, and so I'm hoping that we find out like some really juicy, detailed information about those two ancient civilizations, which have vanished off the face of the earth. But before I bring Frank on, I just want to remind you all that Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com and the Institute of Applied Energetics. That's www.AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com. And do please check out the Soul Healer website where you can find out about all the services I offer, including medical intuition evaluations, clairvoyant readings, and energy medicine healings. Plus, lots of articles, all kinds of good stuff. Please do check it out. Um, if you want, you can also go to the Just Energy Radio webpage, that's www.justenergyradio.com, and sign up for our weekly newsletter that will keep you informed of the programming that's coming up next on the show. Um, you can also go there and access our over five years of wonderful archives, which include, uh, well, hang on, I can tell you the exact number if I click on this little button, one, two, three, four, four other interviews with Frank that he's uh, come on the show. Anyway, so let me tell you a little bit about Frank Joseph and get him on the air. Frank Joseph is the author of a dozen published books about metaphysics, military, and ancient history released in as many foreign languages. He has been a repeat guest with Shirley MacLaine on her internet program, with Whitley Strieber on Dreamland, Coast to Coast with Art Bell, The Jeff Wrench Show. He's also a featured writer for Fate Magazine, Command, and Atlantis Rising. His articles about military aviation, which is a very interesting combination with metaphysics, uh, have been published by the Department of Defense. So from uh, Mystic Valley Media dot com, please welcome Frank Joseph to the show. Hey Frank, how's it going? Oh wonderful Rita. Thanks for inviting me back. I always have a great time with your show here. I'm I love having you on because you always cover well one topics that I'm interested in. And you know the last time I think it was the last time you were on we were talking about uh yeah, the gods of the runes and I was thinking, well I, you know, shows where people just want to do, you know, readings and stuff on the show just mm-hmm. don't really work, but when I was looking through your book, I'm like, ah, oh, he's getting into all the mythology and the law and, and just, you know, all that behind-the-scenes material, which I find fascinating and I think my audience likes listening to as well. So today, we're going to be talking about lost civilizations, and one of the things that we wanted to uh, put out there was that you're part of a compilation book put out by New Page uh publishers called Lost Civilizations and Secrets of the Past, which I'm just like flipping on the back, I guess has articles in here by Eric Von Donneken, Philip Coppins, Marie Marie Jones and Larry Flaxman, um, all except Eric Von Donneken being friends of the show. Um, so what did you, I mean, you wrote about Lost Civilizations. How did you get involved in that whole project? 
Well, uh, I was asked by the publisher you mentioned in New Page Books uh, to participate in this uh, compilation of all these wonderful writers, so I feel very flattered that I'm in such an uh, interesting company. Um, what I decided to, to write about was archaeological scandals, and uh, that has to deal with the deliberate cover-up of American prehistory. And one of the culprits that I focus on is the Smithsonian Institution, which, don't get me wrong, is a, is a great organization. Uh, by and large, the Smithsonian is a tremendous national, international treasure. But unfortunately, some of the directors of the Smithsonian for more than 100 years have been involved in a deliberate falsification of American prehistory and history and have so politicized American archaeology that they have divorced the American consciousness from our own roots which I think is a nothing less than a cultural crime that's been committed against the United States of America. And that said, in general, I go to some specifics where there was deliberate falsification of evidence and cover-up of evidence to show that numerous peoples have been visiting North America for thousands of years, not only before Columbus, but before even Columbus's Spain came into existence. And that Columbus was a great man, he was a tremendous discoverer, but he was only one in a long line of discoverers, not only from Europe, but also from Africa, from West Africa, from Asia, uh, the, amongst the Celtic peoples, uh, the Romans, the Greeks, all of them were here. They were, uh, this one book that came out some years ago is called They All Discovered America, and that title is true. There has been tremendous impact from all over the world in North America for thousands of years, and civilizations have risen and fallen before our own took root only about 200 years ago. And that's the main thrust of the article that I wrote. I wanted to expose some of those cover-ups. It's a, del a deliberate conspiracy. People think, oh, God, a conspiracy theory, you're paranoid and so on. But if you've got uh, facts to back it up, well, actually, unfortunately, America and possibly the Western world, I mean, really the whole world now, is run by conspiracy anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's really what we're run by, is just a number of circles of conspiracy, either in the economic, political, or military spheres. I know that from first hand. And so why not uh, from history, too? History is a conspiracy also. So I guess if you want to call me a conspiracy freak, I guess I am, because I realize that that's the world the way is that's the way the world is is run today. <laughs> but if you want to control people's viewpoint, you have to control their history. That's exactly what George Orwell said in his very prophetic novel, 1984, who controls the past, controls the present. Who, com who controls the present, controls the future. That was the uh, motto of the tyranny of Big Brother that's described in 1984. And unfortunately, some of the leaders of our country have taken that to heart, or leaders of our culture have taken that to heart, and have applied that to the falsification and the deliberate uh, cover-up of our, of our roots, of our prehistoric roots. But I don't think that it's just in the United States. I mean, it's no. happening globally. You know, it's global, right? right. But uh, no, I don't single out the United States by by any means. Uh, you can you can find the same uh, deliberate uh, subversion, cultural subversion going on elsewhere. I find that to a lesser extent in some countries. You go to the extreme of this in a place like China, where everything is totally regulated, and you believe only what the state wants you to believe. And then you go to a place not too far away in Japan, where the Japanese, uh, even on the academic level, are more open to these questions than I found elsewhere. So it's not unilateral, but it is found elsewhere, as you say. I mean, well, it might even be a couple of years ago on the show, we were tried this thing where we would ask, I would ask a question, and some, you could win a, a copy of a book you know, from one of the guests that we've had on. And so the question I asked was, who discovered America? <laughs> <laughs> it's a loaded and question. So, <laughs> well, you know, and I got a lot of Columbuses, you know, like, well, is that the stupidest question I ever heard? And, um, <laughs> you know, and people that kind of think outside the box, you know, they go, well, you know, I guess there was like Leif Erikson. Yeah, you know, we could throw him out there. And then I always interject with, well, don't you think the Native Americans found it before he did? <laughs> there were people before the Native Americans, too. That's the interesting thing. <laughs> right. There were people long before the so-called Native Americans were here. 
one of the things that I, I bring up in the chapter is uh, talk about a scandal, archaeological scandal, is the uh, tragic story of Virginia Steen McIntyre, who in the 1970s was a leading archaeological specialist in dating archaeological sites according to um, fire in the area. Like if you found a campfire that somebody lit uh, a long time ago, she was expert in saying exactly how long ago that was. And she and her colleagues were asked to come down to a place in central Mexico, not that far from Mexico City, to examine this old set of campfires. Archaeologists knew that they were old. They went back many hundreds of years at least, maybe a few thousand years, so they wanted to know how far back in time they went. You have to understand that the archaeological paradigm, the dogma, the doctrine today, is that nobody arrived in the Americas before 12,000 years ago, at most 13,000 years ago, at most. And they only came over from a land bridge, which we now know is non-existent, <laughs> from <laughs> Siberia to Alaska. But in any case, that is what the mainstream insists happened, and that nobody was here in the Americas, certainly not in Mexico, before 12,000 years ago. So Virginia Steen McIntyre goes down and examines this old campsite, and she applies the same methods that she's been using for years and, ha and was praised for her work, by the way, because she's a leading world expert in this, in dating according to fire, fire damage. And she looked at this campsite with her colleagues, and she came to the conclusion that that campsite that was made by human beings in central Mexico was a quarter of a million years old, 250,000 years ago. So she said, that can't be, that's impossible, there wasn't anybody here that long ago. So she did the test over again, I think about five times, sent them to about a dozen different laboratories, all came back the same. The evidence you have from this campsite in Mexico is a quarter million years ago. So she went public with it, and she told her, her peers for peer review, and rather than accepting this as a tremendous discovery, an incredible discovery that shows that there were human beings with the use of fire... Uh, building a campsite in Mexico a quarter of a million years ago. This is before even the so-called real evolution of, long before the evolution of modern man. What they did is they threw her out of the profession. They completely blackballed her, her and her colleagues, one of her colleagues, her Mexican colleagues, his evidence was seized by the Mexican federal government, and he was forbidden henceforward to practice archaeology in Mexico. She went back to the United States, tried for 40 years, 40 years to try to get this information, even peer-reviewed by her fellow archaeologists. They would have nothing to do with her. They so marginalized her career, she ended up selling flowers. She became a kind of a florist just to be able to support her mother, and she's out of the profession. Just because she came up with evidence which was contrary to the paradigm. And if this was just one case like that, I figured, like, well, she just had some bad luck with some pretty nasty people. But it's consistent. And in that little chapter that I've written, uh, you will see she's just a small part of this official clampdown on anything that is contrary to that official paradigm. But I cite her case because it is, it is among the most outrageous Here's one of her, one of their own people, a university trained, world class expert, but because she came up with information that was unacceptable politically, she was out, and she, she, her career was ruined. How about that? How about them apples? It's just sad, you know. And what I think is just kind of funny, um, you know, you look at the evolution of man from. I'll say the historical record, just, you know, what they put out there. But then somewhere, somehow, we learn how to do all of this stuff, yet in the meantime, we barely, you know, like the pyramids are supposed to be, you know, like 2500 B.C. You know, we barely have metal tools. We don't barely have a potter's wheel. You know, we barely have these <laughs> tools. Meanwhile, we're hauling blocks or, you know, the the stonework at Soxy Waman. It's like, it's incredible. How do they move this stuff? How did they carve this stuff? You know. It is, it is funny. That's a great point you bring up, Rita. 
because you're right. Here, we're, and this is what the archaeologists say. Well, you know, about 3,000 years ago, the, there were only a few thousand people living in the Nile Valley. They were very primitive. They didn't have any agriculture to speak of. They certainly didn't understand irrigation and all that. And then, all of a sudden, they decided building pyramids that we can't build today. They had no advanced tools, they had no mathematics, they had no social organization, they had no astronomy, they had nothing. And then all of a sudden, hey, let's build a great pyramid. <laughs> I mean, yeah. what is missing here, you know? But that's, that is the official line. I've simplified it, but that's what they say. I've even, I've even read an archaeologist not too long ago who said that, well, yeah, you find these pyramids all over the world, and physically they look similar, and they have similar orientations and all that, but that doesn't mean that anybody was actually in touch with each other on other sides of the oceans. It just means that people sort of naturally started doing these things simultaneously. I mean, it's incredible the insanity that and passes for And see, to me, that, that is just ridiculous. And yet it's that is in a book by a, a major archaeological scholar saying, well, these stories about people crossing the oceans before Columbus, it's all silly because people just are, naturally, they just want to build pyramids. <laughs> but even know, when you it, look it, at it, the mythology, perhaps. but when you look at the mythology, it's like, why would they all make up the same story? Well, You know, if, if they all yeah. came up independent in all these different areas... Why do they tell the same story? Because you could have other things happening. I, You know, you could take this one thing, this tree over here, and I'm going to tell you how it came into existence. Well, my story is not going to be the same as your story. So why are all these cultures around the world all saying that the tree came into existence in the exact same way? It doesn't make any logical sense at all. No. Well, you can't, a you can't ask a lot of these scholars to make logical sense, you know. All right. It, but that's the, that's the main reason I wrote that. And I, in a way, I didn't like writing the archaeological scandals because it was all very negative. And I put it off for quite a while. But I figured some of this stuff has has got to get out, you know. And that's uh, <laughs> like, for example, another Smithsonian. Uh, well, I didn't talk about the Smithsonian yet, but there was a Smithsonian cover up that involved a, a major, major discovery made by one of their own people, a Smithsonian archaeologist. And in 18, oh gosh, at the end of the 1800s, I don't know the exact date, I think it was 1898, something like that, uh, this archaeologist working for the Smithsonian was in eastern Tennessee, next to a little place called Bat Creek. And on the, on the banks of Bat Creek, or Bat Creek, were a number of these uh, so-called Indian mounds. Like you find thousands of them all across the United States. And so he was just uh, going through the process of excavating one of these burial mounds, and he found some skeletons in the mounds, again, not unusual at all, human skeletons. And under the skull of one of the skeletons, he did find something that was unusual. It's a small tablet. And on this tablet was some funny writing. And he could not read it. So he gave it to his superior, Cyrus Thomas, who was the head of the Smithsonian Archaeological Department in those days, the end of the 19th century. And Thomas looked at this tablet that was taken from under the skull of this a figure that was in the Indian mound and said, uh, I don't know uh, what this writing is, but it's probably something that somebody put in there in modern times, probably just some extrusion. So they didn't think much of this tablet at all. And they put it in the Smithsonian in their catalog and they photographed it. And many years later, a cryptographer from World War II, Henrietta Mertz, who was a specialist in cracking the enemy codes and had a real eye for that sort of a thing, thought that this tablet that the Smithsonian had found looked like an ancient language to her. So she contacted Cyrus, or she contacted uh, Cyrus Gordon, another Cyrus, Cyrus Gordon, who was the leading Semeticist of his day. He was professor, professor of ancient world languages at Brandeis University in New York, and he looked at the photograph of this Bat Creek tablet that had been taken and said, that is ancient Hebrew. He says, I can identify it. I know what it says. It says, for Judea. And it was written around 125 A.D. So when this information came out, the Smithsonian said, oh, no, that couldn't possibly be. Uh, Dr. Gordon, is, he was, they was referred to then afterwards as a rogue professor. And this guy's credentials are just like world class. 
and they insulted him by saying he's a rogue professor by saying this. No way could this be. And so the Back Creek Tablet, as it was known, was a controversy for a long time between the mainstream archaeologists who said, no, it's just really nothing, a modern uh, uh, intrusion, and others who thought, well, this represents possibly Hebrew-speaking visitors to North America nearly 2,000 years ago. So it was unsettled until only last year, 2011, a world-class geologist by the name of Scott Walter in St. Paul, Minnesota. He runs his own geological laboratory. It's an award-winning laboratory. Analyzed the Bat Creek stone and the inscription on this stone. And he determined after five weeks examination with electron scanning microscopes and the most state-of-the-art equipment that that inscription in that tablet could have only been made nearly 2,000 years ago. No way could the minerals that have leached into that inscription have taken place any time earlier. So he, he positively identified that Back Creek inscription, which says for Judea it was found under unimpeachable conditions by a Smithsonian archaeologist as having been carved in fact by someone who spoke Hebrew known as Paleo-Hebrew, about the year 125 A.D. and buried in that mound, which is also dated to about that time. So here is physical, hard evidence that there were visitors from the Near East in our country nearly 2,000 years ago. And yet, has there been any announcement in the newspapers? Have you seen anything like that on the nightly news? Has there been any revision of our textbooks? No. It's been greeted with absolute silence. And when Scott Walter asked the archaeologist to review his work, let's have some peer review going on, point out any failings you can find, they refused. They have nothing to do with it. It's all a hoax, and they just ignored it. And they've been ignoring our prehistory for many years before that. But that's another example. And if I get too hot about this, because uh, it, it's outrageous. It's just outrageous. What would be interesting is if they did a DNA analysis of the skull that was resting on top of it, because it might not even be a Native American skull. You know, Rita, you are so good. <laughs> you're, you're ahead of me, because that is exactly, <laughs> that is exactly what is going on right now. Woohoo! It's the, a psychic the, thing. The, uh, the tablet has been returned from, uh, has been turned over from the Smithsonian to the Cherokee Nation because it was found in their territory, it was removed without their permission, and the Cherokee now have that tablet, and they also are now petitioning the Smithsonian to turn over the skeletal remains from that dig for modern DNA testing. The Smithsonian is saying, uh, well, we don't know where those bones are. Maybe we lost them, which is pretty scary. You're not supposed to just discard uh, material like that. So they're all in what, Warehouse 13. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> along with the Ark of the Covenant and everything that's else. That's right. <laughs> but the, that is what the Cherokee Nation is involved in now. They are they have already petitioned the Smithsonian directors to turn over that skeletal material for DNA testing. So won't that be something? That will be something. We'll we'll just cross our fingers for that one. Well, we'll see. I wouldn't depend on the Smithsonian to be too cooperative, but uh, the Cherokee are very hot about this, so we'll see what happens. You know, don't you only wish you had, like, a backstage pass for the Smithsonian? You could go into their archives and just kind of dig around and look at what they're not putting on display? No, I, I wish that I was just in charge of the federal marshals, and we'd just go in there and take the place over <laughs> without letting them know. Just a surprise visit and just <laughs> seize the place. That's what I'd really like to do. Okay. <laughs> okay, well let's let's turn our attention because we were going to talk about Lemuria and Atlantis. Um but let's start cuz I think today um you know a lot of people are familiar with, you know, the concept of Atlantis. So I wanted to start with Lemuria. Um so let's just car- start pretty easy. Um where is it believed that Lemuria existed? Well, I have to sort of begin with myself a little bit. I, I, I don't want to talk about myself too much, but um, I use my personal story because I think it's the story of a lot of other people that are interested in Lemuria. 
Uh, first, I regarded the whole thing as a complete hoax. I thought there was nothing to it. Um, I read a couple of books about it. They weren't particularly persuasive. But when I began traveling through the Pacific and uh, through Polynesia and Southeast Asia, I could not ignore the tremendous collection of uh, mythical traditions about such a place. So to answer your question, I do not believe that Lemuria was a continent. It could have been. I don't rule that out completely. There is something called the Pacific Rise, which is a very peculiar phenomena in the uh, northwest Pacific, uh, which is not that not that deep. I, I don't know how deep. I think it's like about 75 feet deep, and it's a large continuous mass, which m almost certainly was above sea level at one time and could be referred to as kind of a continental Landmass that is possible. However, my research, Rita, to be perfectly honest, does not really indicate a former continent. Although, like I say, I do not rule that out. But my research seems to indicate that Lemuria was less a territory, less a land, than a people and a culture spread out over archipelagos of islands, strung out across the entire Pacific, all the way into the Indian Ocean, all the way up into northern India. So when we talk about Lemuria, rather than a territory, we're really talking about a culture and the people that created it, who inhabited various landforms throughout the Pacific and into the Indian Ocean. And some of those islands, many of those islands still exist. Lemurian culture, Lemuria has never been lost. I can take you to Lemurian sites right now. If you've, got, if you've got the financial <laughs> wherewithal, they're pretty far away. Uh, but there are numerous Lemurian sites that have been found underwater all the way from uh, northern India down through the uh, uh, Ryukyu Islands of South Japan, all the way off the coast of California. There are underwater sites. And there are also sites on land, like Nan Madol in the island of Panap in Micronesia. Macronesia, excuse me. There are numerous indications and ruins of Lemuria that still exist. They have just been misidentified, I believe, or really not identified at all. Uh, in Tahiti, for example, there is an enormous step pyramid. Here you talk about the pyramids again. A huge step pyramid quarried out of masses of stone, beautifully made. The native Tahitians there do not claim that their ancestors are responsible for the construction of this pyramid. They talk about a previous people called the Hiti. As a matter of fact, the name Tahiti means the land of the Hiti or the land of giants. The Hiti are referred to as this race of fair-haired giant people who built this structure in the ancient past. And you find this same story with major variations, of course, all throughout the Pacific where you encounter these unusual structures. So I think that Lemuria still exists. I just think it needs to be uh, recatalogued and re-understood. Well, the most famous, of course, is Easter Island. Uh, Easter Island with its great statues called Moai. This is all part of a culture which dominated, in a very gentle way, uh, the, the entire Pacific realm for thousands and thousands of years. And, uh, well, to answer your question, yeah, I believe that Lemuria is spread out still in this the series of archipelagos and islands which can be visited today. I have a friend who's been on the show, um, Brian Forrester, who his primary work has been on the elongated skulls in South America. Oh. But he's just finished a book because the elongated skulls have red hair. A lot of them have red hair. Yeah. And one of the things that he tracked down was that a lot of these Pacific Island cultures have red hair. You know, and you look at the Cyclopedian building in South America, and you find it in Easter Island. And so he has been looking kind of in a backwards way at, you know, or in a, from a different angle at, at what you're actually saying is that there is a connection between the Americas, you know, and the East. Well, there, there's no doubt about it. You can go look at the Andean structures, like at Cozumel, and you'll see that a very peculiar type of masonry in which the stones are like different pieces of a puzzle, beautifully fitted together without mortar. These are remarkable, rather unique constructions. You don't find too many places in the world. 
and you go straight across the Pacific to the next landfall, which would be Easter Island, and you see the exact same type of stone masonry. So there's obviously a connection. Even the names that are used for uh, different products, like uh, the Inca word for sweet potato is kumara. And that exact same word, kumara, is used for a sweet potato in various specific islands, including Tahiti, by the way, I just mentioned. So there's obviously uh, a relationship going on between the Atlantic, or rather, excuse me, between the Andean cultures of Peru and Bolivia and what we're finding in the Pacific. There's no doubt about it. And then when you look behind these physical uh, pieces of evidence like the sweet potato or the great stone walls you look behind them through the myths of these people always you find the story of a great flood and you find that this flood is associated with a race of red-haired giants who were responsible for building these uh, tremendous structures and so are we talking the biblical flood no we're not okay. uh, this is something which is on the other side of the world the biblical flood, we have to understand, the Bible, the Old Testament as we have it today, is a creation of the Hebrew people who picked up this information from other peoples. The Hebrews describe themselves as a mosaic people. Mosaic meaning you pick up bits and pieces of other cultures and you infuse it, uh, you put your own spin on it. And that really is what the Old Testament is. The Old Testament is based on the Sumerian story of the Epic of Gilgamesh, it's based on Babylonian stories of the Great Flood. And the biblical stories really only originates amongst the Hebrew people. We're talking maybe during the Babylonian captivity of about uh, you know, 600 B.C., 500 B.C., something like that. And these stories go back millennia before that time. Sumerians were writing this down in the fourth millennium B.C., for gosh sakes. So these <laughs> stories are much older. But they do not... Uh, pertain at all to what happened in the Pacific. We understand now, and I think everybody understands now, looking at recent events as took place in Japan a year ago and in Indonesia a few years before that, that the planet we live on is extremely dynamic. It's not a static place. And that something like a monstrous flood that could totally wipe out a civilization is not as incredible as it may have seemed to mainstream scholars just a few years ago. When you consider that a quarter of a million people died in the Indonesian earthquake, and something like twenty to 30,000 people perished in northern Japan, a modern country like that, certainly a place like Lemuria, which was not as materially advanced in some regards, technologically advanced as we are, certainly would have suffered uh, equivalent or worse uh, fatalities than, than we have known. The Lemurians, I think, were not as materially advanced as we are, but I think spiritually and psychologically, socially, they were way ahead of us. Uh, the Lemurians strike me as a people who were disinterested in the material effects of a high civilization. They were a civilized people. They had their ceremonial centers, not not cities in the sense that we understand them. They didn't believe in urban centers, it does not appear. They believed in villages and towns, but they had their ceremonial centers where they would congregate for certain events. But what most interested the Lemurians would appear to be their spiritual development. And in this regard, they were not that different than modern-day Tibetans. The Tibetans today are primarily a people who have a kind of a national ethic. And this ethic pertains to the Buddhist concept of improving the soul and freeing it from samsara, or the constant recurrence of reincarnation. The goal is, to, is not to be reincarnated, but to go into a higher spiritual destiny. And... That is really what motivates uh, the average Tibetan today. And I think something similar to that uh, was the mainspring of Lemurian civilization. You know, we're talking about Lemuria, but I've also heard of another culture that came out of the Pacific, which is Mu. Are we talking about the same people, different people? What's going on with the two different groups? It's not two different groups. It's the same place. 
you have to understand that a culture which is able to exist over many centuries is naturally going to have uh, different names applied to it by different cultures. So whether we refer to it as Mu or Lemuria, there are other names for it as well. Uh, Ramu, um, the Japanese refer to it as Horai. These are just cultural inflections on the same place. Mu perhaps was its original name. It means literally mother or the motherland, according to uh, James Churchward, who did all the first real heavy research on Mu in the late 19th century. So Mu is one of the names that refers to this high Pacific culture that we're talking about. Um, the people in Macronesia, for example, they refer to it as uh, uh, um, I can't even pronounce it, Kamanasuero. Kamanasuero. Um, the, the people of Easter Island refer to this previous lost Lemurian civilization as Mare Renga. So these are just different names for the same place because you have different people of different languages. And I think that's what what we're referring to. The, the name Lemuria comes from Rome, interestingly enough. The, the they Romans, named everything. <laughs> well, the, the Romans had a uh, festival called the Lemuria. And the Lemuria took place over a uh, six-day period every other day for six or seven days in May, in the early May. And the purpose of the, the Roman Lemuria was a kind of a Halloween. It was like the Latin version of Halloween, uh, in which the souls of the deceased came back, the ghosts came back into uh, our sphere. Usually the ghosts of people who had died uh, through violence or who died in an untimely death. And so the Lemuria was a kind of a, a time where you made propition to these gods, or the, these ghosts rather. And it relates to a lost kingdom the Romans believed existed. And they differentiated this from Atlantis. It was a completely different place. They didn't know exactly where it was, but that it had ceased to be in a violent way. And that's why they called it the Lemuria. And that's how we get the name Lemuria today from ancient Rome. Hmm. Interesting. But I the name Lemuria, to... interestingly enough, is not only exclusively Roman. Uh, the Chumash Indians of Southern California referred to Santa Barbara Island off the coast of California as a sacred place, a memorial place that they would occasionally go to uh, in their wonderful boats. The Chumash uh, created some wonderful boats called Tomals, very Viking-like looking boats, incredibly enough. And they referred to Santa Barbara as Limu, interestingly enough. So that's, I think that the name of this this culture uh, was very close to, if not exactly like Limu or Lemuria, uh, Mu, something like that, very close to that. What kind of um, mythology comes from the different cultures in Polynesia, Easter Island, that... Um tells us about, you know, the people of Lemuria, the culture of Lemuria. Well, we can start with Easter Island. That's the most famous place. And as I said, the people of Easter Island referred to this previous uh, uh, land before it sank as Mare Renga. And the name Mare Renga, we don't know exactly what it means, but it appears to reference the sun in some way. And the story of Mare Renga, as told to the early, early Spanish conquerors of Easter Island, was this. That in the ancient past, Mare Renga was this enormous kingdom. And that the people who lived on this kingdom were sun worshippers. They had a highly advanced and very wise uh, culture. They had all kinds of what they called magic or high technology. And they could uh, their their consciousness could go into the pa the deep past or the far future. They could range throughout time, and the Lemurians were informed by their priests. Uh, not the, not the people of Mare Renga were informed by their priests that Mare Renga was going to be destroyed by a great wave, a warrior wave, and uh, a series of earthquakes that were caused by this god with a great uh, 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 crowbar 
this was the analogy that a god, an angry god, a sea god with a crowbar would overturn Mare Renga and a great wave would come and that would be the end of Mare Renga. And the king of Mare Renga, whose name is recorded, I don't remember it offhand, but the king of Mare Renga selected his son, whose name was Hatu Matua. And Hatu Matua was instructed by his father to load up a great ship a huge ship. And this is interesting because uh, the Polynesians, although they were wonderful mariners and had wonderful boats, they did not have huge ships. But the story of Mare Renga is that Hatu Matua had this enormous ship, very big, like about a mile long, we're told. Might be a hyperbole, but it's an indication that he had a big ship. And he was to put into the ship his family, his extensive family, the royal family, and his followers and sorcerers, and to load it up with uh, food and cattle, and uh, not cattle, but animals and plants, and leave Mare Renga before Mare Renga was destroyed. So Hatu Matua gets into this boat with all of his followers. They take off, and as they're leaving, the myth describes uh, shooting stars, stars falling out of the sky. Some of them hit Mare Renga, and then the great uh, god comes out of the sea with his crowbar and overturns Mare Renga. A wave comes in. Mare Renga is destroyed, is sunk beneath the waves. Hatu Matua and his family in their boat, they go to a new land. And this land, which we refer to as Easter Island, is referred to as Rapa Nui. And Rapa Nui is this land where they set themselves up. And that's the name of the island. And the the title of this island, Rapa Nui, they give another name to it, is uh, Tepito Te Henua. Tepito Te Henua means the navel of the world. And the reason it's called the navel of the world is because Hatu Matua had his greatest treasure from Maure Renga brought with him. And this great treasure was a crystal, a large crystal, was an egg-shaped crystal which contained all of the magic that was necessary to rebuild civilization at Rapa Nui or Te Pitu Te Henua, the navel of the world. That's what this little island was called. And so Hatu Matua recreated civilization on the island of Rapa Nui. And then in the 18th century, long afterwards, a Dutch captain by the name of Rogaveen Found Easter, uh, found this island, and he called it Easter Island because he had found it on uh, Easter Sunday. I think it's 1772, if I'm not mistaken. So that's the that's the basic mythical story, one of the big myths of the founding of of Easter Island, how it came to be. Well, you know, for how I'm going to say small Easter Island is, you would think that crystal would be around there somewhere. It still kind of hard to lose it. It has not been lost. It still is there. It's at Acapena Bay. You can go there and see it today. It's not preserved or anything. It's just sitting there in Acapena Bay. Acapena Bay is on the, I think, the northeast shore of Easter Island. And it was removed from a temple that uh, once housed it, and it is there now. It's, it's called uh, the Naval Stone, Tepito Tehenawa. Well, that's, I think, actually pretty interesting um that it's still there because in other places that have naval stones, you know, like in Delphi, they're all gone or have been right. replaced. That's right. The original naval stone in Delphi uh, was stolen perhaps by the Goths when they invaded and took it over, or maybe it was hidden by the priests, who knows. And the naval stone that you see there today, that's a, a stone recreation. The original was also crystal. That's the interesting thing, isn't it? You talk about common themes around the world. One of the big common themes is uh, a sacred crystal, which is venerated as the most uh, holy object that a people pro possess. And sometimes these um, holy stones, these holy crystals are lost, and other times they are preserved, like the uh, Chintamani stone uh, from t uh, Tibet. That is one that's, one of them is in um, the Nicholas Rarick Museum in Moscow. So some of them still exist. But I think it would, you know, because there's also the mythology tied to them that they held this information or held power. You know, there's something tied, and it's like, why doesn't anybody 
shoot lasers into it. You know, they do that with all the stupid crystal skulls. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to see if there's any kind of information or energy encoded into these stones. Well, apparently, though, the, shooting a laser into it might be cool to see what happens. But well, I, uh, you know, I'm just kind of throwing it out there, Frank. Yeah. Uh, apparently, the way these things work, though, the, the general tradition associated with these stones is through uh, guided meditation, through very deep meditation, that these stones really are um, bi- biophysical uh, devices. They're supposed to work, this is the, the, the stories associated with them, including the Ark of the Covenant, by the way, um, which also contained what they called a sapphire, quote-unquote, a special stone. Anyway, these stones are supposed to work uh, if you go into deep meditation and you interrelate with the stone on some level, and that will expand one's consciousness. Uh, that's basically what the stones are, are involved in. They're supposed to be like uh, soul boosters, I suppose, if you want to look at it, and to to infuse great spiritual uh, potency to those who know how to use them. Well, I guess nobody in this century is going to <laughs> be able to access it if you have to get into that level of deep meditation. Well, I don't I know. Mean, I maybe, think it would, it would be worth trying. I'd love to go to Easter Island and, and try my hand at the uh, at the navel of the world stone in Acapena Bay. I don't know that I'd succeed at it, but it's sort of like uh, the, the story in the uh, film uh, Forbidden Planet where they have these mind boost things that you put on your head and you'd get all kinds of super intelligence. Well, these things are not so much super intelligence as um, spiritually empowering. That's what they're supposed to be. So it's interesting, uh, especially interesting because almost every culture in the world has um, stories of these stones that they once possessed. Kind of interesting. But, you know, but they all came up with them independently yes. because they didn't talk to each other. No. No, some of these cultures are separated not only by thousands of miles, but thousands of years, and there's obviously no connection. The Japanese have the same thing, the Kanamanishi stone, uh, the, which means literally the navel stone, the same thing. Uh, very interesting. You find that uh, in, in many parts of the world. Delphi that you mentioned, in Rome, back again, there's the, uh, it's called the Urbis. Uh, the temple for the Urbis still exists. Uh, Orbis meaning the the world stone, the center of Rome, the navel of Rome, the, at the temple of Saturn. That still exists there. The stone doesn't, but the temple still exists. Interesting. Um, I want to talk a little bit about arc, the archaeological evidence, and we have about 12 minutes till we need to take a commercial break. And one of the things that you talk about is the site at Namadal, which I think is uh-huh. fascinating. And uh-huh. I was hoping you could kind of talk about that a little bit first. Well, we talk about Le- Lemurian uh, technology and evidence. Uh, Namadal is certainly one of the most outstanding, extraordinary places on the face of the globe. And most people have never heard of it, know nothing about it. Nan Madol is an artificial city. You can go and visit it today. It's very far away from every place. It's in Macronesia. I think the nearest landfall is like 2,200 miles away in Japan. And it is just off the northern coast of an island known as Ponap. And the island of Ponap is a very small, unproductive island, but just north of it, is this very bizarre stone city that is built literally on a coral reef. It is built in the water. It is a large city, something like nine square miles that are known, and it is made entirely out of magnetized basalt. Now, I'm not making this up. It's not so bizarre. The city itself comprises an enormous harbor works something like about a quarter of a mile long it is made up of many of these square they look like pens of some kind or canals matter of fact non madol has been referred to as the venice of the pacific because these these square foundations basement like foundations are all connected by canals a series of hundreds of canals There is also a tower, which originally was 60 feet high. Now it's about something like about 20-some feet high, made out of magnetized basalt. Huge walls, again. No cement is involved, and the construction is all like Lincoln logs. 
piled up rather crudely compared to what you'd find in Egypt, perhaps, but nonetheless the work is on a scale that would require, obviously, tens of thousands of laborers over a very long time to produce far many more people than could have possibly have been supported by the little nearby island of Ponap. And this place is so remarkable for its construction that the native people, again, refer to it as a place that was built by these two brothers, these two giant brothers who came from across the sea long ago and from an island which has since sunk, an island of great wisdom, they say, that has since perished in the sea, and that they created Nanmadol. Nanmadol means, by the way, the spaces in between. And I guess it re- that name refers to the canals there. And Nanmadol was built by these two giant brothers with the help of a flying dragon. What exactly that flying dragon means, I don't know, but it sounds like some kind of high technology that a people that did not possess that type of technology would refer to. And it's an incredible place. (laughs) I mean, if this thing was built on a coral reef, then where did they get the basalt blocks from? Uh Aha, big question which nobody has been able to answer. Where did they get 200 this is this is amazing 250 billion pounds excuse me 250 billion tons of basalt that has made up this city that's how big this is nobody the source for that basalt does not exist they don't know where it came from also part of the city are underwater tunnels that go down from the city of Namadol something like 30 feet below the surface of the water and that these these Uh, corridors, these tunnels, open up into underwater chambers. They have been studied by the University of Oregon professors. This is not something I'm channeling or making up. This is is actual archaeological material. (laughs) Who could have Were they above ground at one, or above water at one point in time? There's no doubt about that. A number of pillars uh, that are from Nanmadal that were shaken by earthquake activity over the past who knows how many thousands of years, have been found uh, sometimes uh, perpendicular, uh, standing straight up at the bottom of the sea. So this is an important discovery because it indicates that Nanmadal was not built in the water as it appears today. It was built on land at a time thousands of years ago when the Pacific Ocean sea level was much lower than it is now. In other words, it was built, Nanmadal was built probably about 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago. That is like 7,000 years before the beginning of ancient Egypt. It's a period of time that archaeologists say is totally impossible. There was nobody in the Pacific at that time who could have built such a thing. But nonetheless, that's the only time when the ocean level was low enough to accommodate those pillars that are now standing upright at the bottom of the sea. Who could have built such a thing? The story of these two brothers that came from a sunken uh, high civilization sounds very Lemurian. I think we can say that it was Lemurian. So Lemuria goes back a very long time. The significance of Lemuria is, I believe, the chief significance. It is the very first place where human beings made the transition from savagery to civilization. I think it is the very first civilization on Earth. I think it's the earliest civilization. It goes back tens of thousands of years and that by 10,000 years ago, it had already reached an extremely high level of proficiency to have built a place like Nanmadol. I just am curious how big those blocks were. You know, I have images, also, but it doesn't really work, of, you know, these uh, Nanmadolians, you know, dragging them on their wooden rollers across no way you the can ocean. Do that, no. Well, I know, but, you know, it... <laughs> But I mean, are they are they giant? I mean, how much do each of the blocks weigh? Do they estimate? 
Well, that that's very good. The the average block weighs the the heaviest block there is like I think 66 tons. It's a 66 ton stone. And when the archaeologists saw this stone, they figured, well, as you mentioned, it was probably dragged or rolled or something. But then when they dug underneath the 66 ton stone, they found that it had been actually raised in the air and positioned on top of another one at a time before the deposition took place. The average uh, weight of the uh, these pillars, these columns, is about 12 tons. Now, can you imagine lifting 12 ton uh, magnetized basalt, something like 40 to 60 feet in the air? Uh, there is no indication that anybody has ever had that kind of machinery in the in the, in, in Macronesia. I mean, we're talking about people who whose material level of culture is very low, and yet this place was obviously built by a very high culture. There have been efforts to date non-Madal, and the dating so far has been very disappointing, has not worked out. The only thing they've been able to date is that somebody had a fish meal at non-Madal about 2,000 years ago. Uh, there's not too much material you can carbon date because it is in a very tropical area, and organic material decays very quickly. So the only really way, the only uh, real um, convincing way to date non Madol is that sea level rise that I mentioned. And since we're finding uh, upright pillars right at non Madol, underneath the sea, about 40 feet below, below the surface, 40 do, I think the deepest one is almost 100 feet, like 90 feet, that would indicate that non Madol was built about 10,000 years ago. You know, then we have sites, and I'm just going to do this as kind of a segue because we need to go to commercial break, um, you know, with like Obekli Tempe, you know, which I think is, you know, they've actually allowed themselves to step out of the box and say, well, this was built, you know, 9,000 B.C., which I personally think is a lot older than that, but 9,000 B.C., um, which still is people taking a major leap but it they is. haven't been poo-pooed too much. No, the thing with Gobeki Tepe, and for those of our listeners that are not aware of this, there is a site that was found in Turkey, in southern Turkey, not too many years ago. I think maybe no more than about 10 years ago. And it's just finally getting really good coverage now. And it's a marvelous site. It's a collection of stone structures that have beautiful uh, carvings in, 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 in bas-relief and that the, the stone pillars, these T-shaped pillars arranged in ovals, appear to be astronomical observatories. And what's remarkable about this site is that it's over 10,000 years old, over 10,000 years ago. This was at the very, very beginning, even before the beginning of the Neolithic period, and yet already a highly advanced complex of stone structures is appearing in southern Turkey. Now, here's here's the shocking thing about that. The name Gobeki Tepe is a local Turkish word, of course, and it means it literally means uh, the navel hill, the, the hill that's like a, a, a belly button. That's a navel hill, the, the hill of, that looks like a navel. Now, that name in Easter Island was originally called Tepitu Tehenawa, which means the navel of the world, What's remarkable is that the structures at Gobeki Tepe in Turkey, on the other side of the world, have their have hands and arms carved on the side of some of these pillars that that cup the navel, that got, cup the navel around. And they're they're sort of anthropomorphic pillars. You find the exact same thing on Easter Island. Those are called the Moai, and these are these great statues whose hands go around the navel in the same way. So are we seeing a relationship between Gobeki Tepe in Turkey and Easter Island on the other side of the world in the Pacific that goes back 10,000 years ago? Is that conceivable that there was a high civilization that long ago? We can't even conceive of such a thing. And yet there is a definite, possible, although admittedly tenuous, uh, connection, it would appear, between Turkey and Easter Island. It's, from, it's, it's something that really needs to be looked into. Mm hmm. Well, and one of the other things that I find, you know, one of those other like connection things is that where they found the earliest dating or earliest occurrence of agriculture was in the mountains 30 kilometers from Gobekli Tempe, too. Yes, yes. 
it's really great talking to you, Rita, because you're very <laughs> up on all this stuff. Most people are not, but you're right. The earliest example of agriculture is also found in the same general vicinity of Gobeki Tepe. So some high culture was already in existence 10, 000, more than 10,000 years ago. It's remarkable. And yet, on the other side of the world, you do find things like non Madal, which also go back about 10,000 years ago. If we knew the real history of humanity, I think uh, we'd have to completely revise all of the textbooks, if not completely throw them out. We have to be absolutely regret. Well, and I'm just going to make one comment before we go to break. You know, they you're using the flood as a date, but it doesn't mean that that structure didn't exist far in the past from that occurrence, you know, with the rise of sea level. Right. Just a thought. Anyway, we need to go to break. I'm Dr. Reed Louise. We're talking to Frank Joseph um, about a bunch of different things. His books, Lost Civilizations, The Lost Civilization of Lemuria, and The Destruction of Atlantis. And we'll be back with Frank after these words from our sponsors. Just Energy Radio with your host, Dr. Reed Louise, will return right after these messages. 